All right, we are at the top of the hour, so we'll get started with this session. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to our service provider showcase. It's part of the data site members meeting. Um, before we get started with this session, just a couple of reminders and housekeeping notes. You can tweet about all of our sessions using the hashtag datasite21. Feel free to introduce yourself in the Zoom chat. Um, as you noticed when you entered the session, we're recording this session. We plan to share uh, share it publicly on our YouTube channel. We'll also be sharing um, slides after, after the session. If you have questions, please use the Q&A tool. Uh, we'll hopefully have a couple of minutes for questions for each of the presenters who will be uh, sharing with us in this session. And with that, we will get started. So we'll have a few service providers uh, talking about their platforms in this session. But before we jump into that, I just want to give a brief introduction um, about the service providers program, um, what the goals are, and how it works. Um, so we launched the data site registered service providers program fairly recently in fall 2020. Um, and the goal of this program uh, was to support both repositories and developers in adopting and implementing DOI best practices. Obviously, there are lots and lots of DOI registration integrations out there, um, but not all of them do things exactly the same way or do things according to our DOI registration best practices. Um, so the goal was to, uh, to encourage developers and vendors to, to really follow those best practices and to encourage uh, two-way communication with data sites. Since we uh, run quarterly meetings with, with service providers, it's a good opportunity to get feedback and stay in touch with the service provider organizations. Um, so what is a service provider exactly? Um, we define it as an organization or individual uh, who builds or supports systems used by other organizations to register DOIs, so um, tools that are primarily built to be used by organizations that are not the service provider themselves. So repository platforms, um, CRIS systems, or uh, developers who develop customizations or custom instances of those kinds of platforms. So to become registered service providers, all of the folks who you'll see here today have integrated uh, a data site API in order to allow other people to, uh, in order to allow data site members to register DOIs. Um, they also provide documentation and first line support to their users, and they've completed an integration review with data site staff. So we, we've seen these, we can, we can vet that they, um, that they work according to best practices. And some of the benefits of doing this are assuring that our members have high quality DOI registration integrations, that there's some consistency among integrations, um, and some assurance that these uh, system developers and providers are active participants in the data site community and that they're working with us to ensure that changes and new features are in, um, in your interest. So that we're not on data site side doing something that's going to break a whole bunch of integrations accidentally. So we have a list of about, I think, 11 current service providers. Um, here today, we have five of them who are each gonna take a few minutes to give you a little bit of an overview of their services or their platform, uh, talk about any new features they have coming up, and then you'll have a couple of minutes to ask them questions. Um, so to get started, I'm gonna hand it over to Susanna Mornati from For Science. Thank you very much, Liz, for uh, this uh, organizing this uh, meeting. Um, I hope uh, the information we will all uh, provide to uh, the attendees uh, will be useful for their uh, projects with the uh, data site. I start uh, sharing my screen so that I can uh, very briefly illustrate what For Science uh, is doing for uh, the community. So, first of all, um, let's start to say that. Uh, 
Uh, we have um, uh, plenty of certifications. Uh, we are a, a solution provider of the Cloud Security Alliance. We are, have a, an ISO uh, um, 9001 certification. We are a certified partner for this space and uh, a certified service provider for ORCID. But above all, we are a service provider for, for data science, uh, data sites. So um, what, what we do in this context, uh, we help uh, the institutions uh, in setting up their integration with data science, uh, data side to get their DOIs uh, in the space, uh, in Dataverse, and, uh, and in OJS. And um, we help uh, institutions improve the, the metadata mapping to include their custom information and additional local information. And uh, we ensure that the integration is working effectively. So we monitor uh, system operations and uh, we are contributing knowledge and expertise in uh, relevant community discussions. Uh, what we do is we share knowledge and innovation via community involvement. We are uh, deeply involved uh, in the Eurocris community uh, to define the SERIF standard for uh, uh, research information. We are working with the COA, the Confederation of Open Access Repositories, and uh, um, mainly in the Next Generation Repositories Working Group and in the editorial board for core vocabularies that are both very relevant for, for repositories. And we're also collaborating with OpenAir, um, uh, helping drafting the guidelines and uh, also participating in several uh, projects uh, for um, bringing innovation into, into the repositories. What are the customizations that we make available both on the space and the space Chris and uh, also on the space version five, which is a, an old one, but still very, very used and uh, um, uh, needing this uh, uh, data side integration. So for both um, this space and in this space Chris and for all versions since version five, so version five, six and seven, we make uh, um, we include the the relevant PIDs such as ORCID and, and um, ROAR for institutions in the data side metadata. We expose the data side metadata according to the Open Air uh, Data Archives guidelines uh, version three, which is uh, uh, already available uh, in this space Chris out of box and it is a customization that we can make on on this space and uh, also import existing records or references via the data site API. And this is coming soon also in this space case as out of box uh, feature. Uh, the open air data archives guidelines have not been uh, released officially yet, but uh, we were recommended to work on version three and th this is what we did. So uh, version three will be published very soon and we are advanced at times. And more customizations, uh, um, Again, for the space and the space Chris version five, six, and seven, uh, we make the DOI assignment customizable uh, according to the institutional strategy uh, for, uh, for instance, uh, the DOIs for selected items or for uh, uh, some collections only. Um, the customization is done according to the institutional strategy or uh, according to predefined rules for generating the DOIs, for instance, uh, specific rules for distinguishing working papers, uh, thesis, and so on, and uh, the data sets, of course. And uh, um, there is a workflow or process for serving a DOI prior to publication, which is also very useful, for instance, to be able to include the DOI already in the produced uh, PDF. And um, in, uh, in uh, version 7.1, uh, this customization will be actually merged with a general community solution that was contributed by uh, the library of code. Uh, um, and uh, I'm sure that Pascal will talk to you about that later. Um, last but not least, we, we provide uh, several services that are useful for the research data management. Uh, such as the CCAN integration for visual, visualization and streaming of data sets uh, in this space, uh, and also the AAAF image viewer uh, that is a very um, sophisticated add-on uh, to be able to explore uh, images uh, and uh, um, using the, the AAAF APIs, uh, image search and, uh, and presentation. So basically, this is um, uh, what we what we provide to the community related to data uh, site uh, services. 
and uh, data side integration. And uh, it is uh, just a, a really very small overview of what we do. Uh, our technical director is Andrea Bollini, and you can get in contact with him or, or with me as well uh, for anything that is related to uh, these uh, uh, services that we can provide. Thank you for uh, giving me this time. Excellent. Thank you so much, Susanna. Um, as I mentioned, if you have any questions, um, please do put them in the Q&A uh, box in, uh, in Zoom. Um, otherwise, since we are running back to back sessions, we will uh, get started with uh, Danny Burke from the Dataverse project. Great, thank you. Let me uh, share my screen. Great. Um, so like Liz said, my name is Danny Brook. Um, I work at a place called the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard. And I work uh, mostly on something called the Dataverse Project. And um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about that today. Um, so when people talk about the Dataverse Project, they're usually talking about one of, one of three things. Um, Sometimes people talk about the Dataverse community, which is a you know, group of people who are interested in um, data science, data sharing, open source software development, um, repo the repository space, um, just people that are interested in allowing researchers to share their data. And you can see a picture from our um, community meeting once we um, are back when we actually could have those meetings in person. Also, when people talk about the Dataverse project, they're talking about all the installations around the world. Um, there are currently 70 installations around the world. And so when people talk about the Dataverse project, they're talking about all the different groups who've installed the software. And then the last way that people talk about the Dataverse project is a place that you can find data. Um, so if you're talking to a political scientist about the Dataverse project, they'll say, oh, put your data up on Dataverse, or um, you can find data about that on Dataverse. So people talk about it in a couple of different ways. Um, the very, very brief overview of, um, of Dataverse is that, you know, we're just trying to make data fair. And so this is an example of um, of, of one of the data sets in Dataverse. And you can see the different ways that um, we approach making data fair in Dataverse. And we do this um, both, both in a human readable way and a machine readable way. Um, so just in terms of the service provider program, and I'm glad that, that Susanna kind of talked about things in terms of how we work with DataSite. Um, the two things that I wanna focus on um, about being in the service providers program is about the idea of the registering DOIs correctly and then supporting the, the creation of that robust metadata. So when I talk about some of the features of Dataverse, I'm gonna kind of frame it um, in terms of that. So what we currently do, how we currently um, integrate with data site. Sorry, my dog has found the squeakiest toy possible. I'll be right back. Apologies, I thought I removed all the squeaky toys from the room. Um, so uh, just in terms of how we interact with data site right now, so we register DOIs for data sets um, and we do reserve those DOIs prior to publication. Um, so so th this allows us to you know, reserve those data sites before the data is made or those, those DOIs before the data is made available and then make and then flip those to, uh, to findable upon, upon publication. Um, additionally, we register DOIs for files. So the way that we structure data in uh, in Dataverse is to um, the uh, the way we structure data in Dataverse is we have files and then we have data sets which um, represent the metadata for those files and serve as kind of a container. Um, and we also work with um, data site. We whenever there's an update made. And then um, if a uh, data set needs to be deaccessioned in Dataverse, we provide that tombstone page aligned with best practices. And then also for, um, for journals and other, other um, institutions that wanna provide that submit for review workflow, we provide, we provide that workflow in Dataverse and we allow for metadata enrichment as part of that. 
And you can see an example of a, a deaccession data set here. It looks like this uh, research article was retracted. So in the next version um, of Dataverse, just to kind of highlight two things related to metadata. Um, so we're gonna be integrating with external um, vocabulary services that allow for more discipline specific data and more robust metadata. You can see an example on the slide here, um, just an integration with um, that allows ORCIDs to be populated more easily, and then also to integrate with a um, with a with um, an external vocabulary about fish culture. And that includes that term URI. So that allows for um, linked data search. And then also in support of the curation process, we're going to, um, we're going to add these, these curation labels as well. And what that, um, what that does, it supports a curation process, whether that's just internal to your group or it needs to communicate with an external system. And these labels are available via API throughout the uh, published process. And then just to, just to kind of highlight the, um, some work that's upcoming. Um, so we currently have a grant that we're working on that's called Harvard Data Commons. And the pieces in there as they intersect with DataCite are um, allowing um, Dataverse to provision those, um, those DOIs earlier in the research life cycle. So if a researcher is working in a research computing environment, they'll be able to use Dataverse and DataCite to, to register those persistent identifiers earlier. We'll also allow um, new object types to be deposited into, into Dataverse, um, specifically scientific workflows, and allow um, those to be registered with DataCite as well. And then um, Dash, which is Harvard's DSpace instance, um, we're going to better integrate Harvard Dataverse um, with that. And the good news is, is this all goes back into the core code of, um, of, of Harvard Data, of Dataverse. And then um, in the case of, um, the, of Dash, that'll go back into the core code of DSpace as well. So it'll allow for better connection between our systems. And then um, I did want to just highlight um, the Global Dataverse Community Consortium Group. So this is a group that's um, started up in the last couple of years, and its goal is to support um, the Dataverse community around the world. And so they, um, they provide discounted data site, um, data site membership and DOIs for groups. Um, they have a community developer that works across the community to kind of consolidate the, um, to, to consolidate the efforts and to get focus on that. Um, and then also there's several working groups that have been, uh, been, that have been sprung up. This is kind of a new area of governance for us because we have been historically run out of Harvard University. So it's really great to see the community start to take more ownership. And then just to, um, just to highlight two, two recent features that we're pretty excited about. So um, we now support much larger data sets. The examples here are from the Arizona State University Dataverse. And so you can see, you can get some pretty big files in and out of Dataverse now. And then another thing that I'll highlight um, is OpenDP. Um, DP is differential privacy. And so we wanna allow um, explorations of sensitive data. And the way that we're um, going to do that is through OpenDP. And this is something that's available in the software now, um, but basically what's, what you'll be able to do is create a differentially private representation of a data set and then share that with researchers and they can then make the decision about whether or not they want to go through the um, process to actually get access to the, um, the whole data set. And then just because this is a community project, I do like to just mention the different ways to get involved. Um, so uh, if you go to dataverse.org, you can see all this, um, but um, I've just added a few specific links here. We have, I think, 125 contributors to the project. So it's very community driven. Um, and even if you're not a developer, there's a lot of different ways to get involved, joining those working groups, um, writing documentation, creating uh, issue reports, um, all the usual, uh, the usual stuff. So thank you for having me and thank you for, um, th thank you for the service providers program. And uh, if y'all have any questions, definitely check out dataverse.org um, or contact me directly on the, uh, the email there. Thank you. Excellent, thanks Danny. Um, next up, we have Tammy Ezra from uh, Ex Libris Esploro. Okay, so hi, good day, everybody. And um, I apologize, my video is, is out, so, uh, but I'm here. Uh, I'll share my desktop. Um, wait, share screen, there we go. Share. Okay, are you seeing it? 
Yes, looks good. Okay, uh, so um, just by name, I'm, I'm Tommy, I, my name is Tommy Ezra and I lead the functional design of Esploro and, and really I just want to give a brief overview of both Exlibris and Esploro uh, to those of you who are not familiar um, and then focus on our integration with data site and then uh, um, maybe talk about what are two things that are coming in terms of integration with data site. So um, Exlibris is a, a ProQuest company um, and uh, for over 30 years now, uh, we've been developing systems geared towards the academic, towards academic institutions. Uh, I won't go through all these numbers, but we've been around and we have uh, many products and many customers around the world. Um, Esploro is one of the newer products that we're working on, and it's built on what we call the Exlibris Higher Education Pla Cloud Platform, which is a platform in the cloud, which gives us um, infrastructure for a variety of things. Um, Esploro is geared towards uh, research specifically, and uh, uh, we're, it's basically a, a, we're developing it as a research information management system. Um, and you know, in terms of our vision, one of the things we really want to achieve uh, as we develop the product, um, which is still quite young, is, is to, to help institutions bridge gaps across uh, research stakeholders. I think you're aware there are many institutions have many, have, uh, have many disparate uh, systems out there. While in many cases, these systems do work on the same data. Um, uh, and um, so the idea is, is to tr to, we're working to develop a, a system that will connect, you know, the various users, the research office, library, and researchers and other entities uh, on campus um, towards goals like showcasing institutional research and researchers, uh, compliance and assessment workflows, and, uh, you know, um, analytics and reports. Um, I won't go into our our structure. I mean, we're plan we already have, and we're playing a lot more functionality around the management of, of, of research. What I want to focus on is that really at the at the at the center of the system is what we're calling the research information hub, um, which um, is a repository for all types of research related entities. Of course, at the heart, and maybe the single most important, aside from researchers, are the research outputs. And we're talking here about all types of outputs. Uh, so not just data sets, but uh, publications, data sets, creative works, uh, you know, basically any kind of output. Um, and then other types of, of, of information or entities or that, that you'd want to, um, to store and track uh, related to research. So these are researcher activities, grants, awarded grants, projects, and uh, I, I can go on and on. But of course, it's here when we talk about the Research Information Hub and um, especially the outputs, this is our connection to data site um, because we enable our institutions to uh, register DOIs uh, for, for unique uh, unique records or our outputs. Um, yeah, just briefly, um, before I delve into uh, dive into into data site. So of course, uh, yeah, many systems uh, need to be uh, interoperable, but maybe especially in the world of research, integrations, partnerships are so important. Research is so collaborative um, and international. So this is just a list of some of the you know the partners that uh, that we are that or systems that we're we're in integrated and interoperating with. So let's focus now on data site. Um, so um, what we do in Explorer is we interface with data site to seamlessly register new DOIs. And this can be done for any type of research output, uh, data sets, but any type of publication in principle, uh, creative works, uh, patents, all, all kinds of things. Um, uh, now, uh, Explorer itself, of course, is not a data site member, um, and we're not working with our own uh, um, uh, prefixes. Uh, we're using um, the account of the customer, and basically, we're just interfacing to make the, the process easier to actually register those DOIs. Um, so this is both for creating, registering new DOIs, and then there's a process for automatic update of the DOI metadata. In other words, as the records change and are modified in Esploro, Esploro will automatically update data site 
um, with the updated uh, metadata related to the to the output. Um, we also have a tombstone page for deleted uh, uh, DOIs, or really the deleted assets, deleted outputs. Um, Another feature is that um, administrators and researchers can reserve a DOI. Um, this is not a mandatory step, but if the researcher does need a DOI, typically I understand um, if you have a data set, you may want to have the DOI so you can send it in advance when you, um, when you submit the article. Uh, based on which is based on that data set uh, for publication, so you can reserve a DOI, both the administrator, researcher himself, or administrators. Registration itself is um, can be done by administrators. Maybe I should say that we have two interfaces. We have a, a dedicated interface for researchers and a dedicated interface for administrators. So the 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 registration of the DOI itself. Um, uh, is done uh, by administrators, and this can be done either at the individual record level, or it can also be done in bulk. Um, finally, maybe just another point uh, is, is that we also support migration of existing DOIs that were registered by another system um, um, into Esploro. And that has its own little separate flow uh, when we migrate res uh, customers uh, to Esploro from other from legacy systems. I thought I'd just briefly show you, I think I still have a couple more minutes. I just thought I'd briefly, briefly show you um, uh, the system, not everything, just, just a couple of points. I'm uh, here, I'm in the back office of, of Explorer, the administrative view, and I'm looking specifically at the various uh, configurations that we have. And the one that I'm looking at uh, that I'm interested in is the DOI integration. Um, and we have here what we call profiles. And you can see we have, at this, at this point in time, we have two profiles, uh, one for data site, one for Crossref, because we also enable uh, customers uh, or institutions to register vis-a-vis -vis Crossref. We, have, we do have some customers that use both data site and Crossref. Um, if we take a look at this um, configuration, you can see this, and this is what needs to be set up for the, the process to start. Um, first of all, you can see that we enable customers to say that um, the registration of DOIs can be limited to specific output types. Um, and this can be both because customers don't want or institutions don't want to register DOIs for everything, or it may be because they uh, use both uh, Crossref and data sites, some of the most used handles. Um, so that's why we also have this, this filtering of, of uh, and of course, this controls when the option to either register or reserve is actually um, presented to, to, to the operator. Um, then we have some uh, place for the um, uh, customer account to be uh, uh, set in, um, where we want the numbers to start, whether there should be any padding, in other words, leading zeros. If we're using, uh, there could also be a test period where the customer just works against test, um, a flag to indicate if we want to start uh, migrating uh, previous uh, uh, DOIs, and also an option to say, do we do we or do we not want researchers to reserve DOIs? Most customers do. There are some that prefer not to have researchers reserve DOIs. Finally, we have also an option, which is uh, I know is not best practice. Best practice is uh, for DOIs to be completely opaque. Um, but for both legacy reasons and, and customer demand, uh, we do enable, it's not mandatory, but uh, we do enable customers to define a, a suffix to the prefix. Um, and this can be defined separately based on the, um, the uh, output type. So you see that in this environment, which is a demo environment, um, uh, data site has been set up to work only for data set, and we define this suffix uh, uh, for, 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 for data sets. So this is the... Um, uh, configuration. Another thing I just thought I'd briefly show you is how researchers can um, can uh, register a uh, reserve DOIs. They can't register, and um, I already access. This is a uh, profile of a very well-known researcher, which we co-opted for our demo environment. Um, and uh, of course, we have here overview, and I'm already on the list of outputs. I could create a new output, but let's just, you know, 
I just want to, I'll edit an ex, uh, something that is, is, is in process is being worked on, being added. Um, and uh, so if I hear I edit, uh, the system displays a form which differs based on the, uh, the output type. In this case, I'm working with the data set. Um, and I won't show you the whole form. That's not the, the point here. Um, but in, in this tab, uh, this is where um, a researcher can either add a DOI if it exists already, or click on this um, button to reserve a DOI. Um, I should say that we, we are not using the data site. We're not using data site to reserve the DOI. The DOI is reserved in the system itself. And when, it's act, when this uh, asset, when this output will actually be registered, um, uh, then we'll use this reserved DOI for the um, in, when we send the data to to uh, when we register vis-a-vis -vis, uh, data site. Um, I can also dismiss it if at the end I decided I made a mistake and I don't actually want a DOI. Um, so this in brief, I think gives I just want to give a picture of you know how how we do the integration, what the the overall functionality is. And uh, just to conclude, some things that we're looking, of course, uh, one thing we haven't done yet, but is, is on our roadmap, immediate roadmap, is to upgrade to data site 4.4. And another thing that we're very eager to, to start working on is um, versions, which is mainly relevant to data sets, not all the uh, publication or the output types. Um, and of course, first of all, versioning within Esploro and then interfacing uh, with data site uh, to support versions uh, for, for, for DOIs. Um, and that's it for me. So, and I, I, I should have started uh, again, thanking Liz uh, uh, for the opportunity to, to present. And again, uh, thank you again for the service provider. Um, it's a, a, a program, it's, it's definitely helpful. Great, thank you so much, Tammy. Um, we'll switch over to Mark from Figshare. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, oh, Tammy, can you turn your screen sharing off, please? Uh, I th oh, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. So I will try and keep us ticking along with time. Greetings from a, a pod in London. Uh, hope everybody is doing well. Um, so I'm here to talk about Figshare today. Uh, we've been working with Datasite for a decade now, which is fantastic. And I've been on the board for the last couple of years. Um, I truly think it's one of the most important bits of research infrastructure that we have in the data space at the moment. So I'm just gonna run through in 10 minutes uh, a little bit about how we work together and what we've been doing. Some of you on the call might be familiar with figshare.com. That's how we started working with Datasite, which is a repository where any academic can come along, upload some files, add some metadata, publish them in a persistent way with a DOI. Things like uh, previewing the files in, in the browser. We preview over a thousand different file formats, version controls, metrics, stuff like that. So um, here you can see, this is from Datasite itself. You can see there's lots of different types of content that researchers are sharing in that way. And you can see that uh, in terms of DOI minting through um, Datasite, that we, we've done a lot of it over the years uh, up there with CERN, which I'm guessing is a lot of Zenodo stuff and others. But today we're talking about um, our repository. So how we work well in terms of making sure that if you're looking for a repository, um, it does everything that you need it to do in the best practice ways to make sure that everything persists and everything is uh, discoverable, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, but also making sure that it works for you as an organization. So we build repositories. Um, we have hundreds of organizations using repositories that we build uh, from the Department of Homeland Security to University of Melbourne to University of Stockholm, all over the world. And uh, this group on the call here, if, if anybody is looking for a repository, I think it's got the full uh, gamut of, of different repositories that you can use. Um, a lot of organizations we work with, especially right now, do not have the uh, development teams in order to to go with some of the great open source options and so 
there's a very multi-dimensional space that we're working in, which is the types of content, the types of metadata, and the types of organization. So uh, we have data repositories, we have institutional repositories. Um, we do classify them as two separate things, although they're essentially the same system, um, because you, it's basically a build your own adventure repository. Whatever you need it to plug into, whether it's a Chris system like Symplectic or Pure, or whether you need to pull in information to any other systems, uh, we, we focus on making sure it's, it's a seamless way to do that. And so when we say used in many wonderful, wonderful ways, so people use it for open educational resources, thesis repositories, conference materials, archives, museums, um, we work the Smithsonian, the British Museum. So there's lots of different content. And even within an organization, this is a university with two subgroups where you can see the different types of content uh, within a repository. So the geophysics group has a lot of data sets and posters, and the music archive has a lot of videos and audio files. Um, and so when we're thinking about this in terms of data sites, we also have to think of it in terms of a bigger corpus of persistent identifiers. And so on the data repository side of things, uh, we're integrated and we work well with uh, data site or uh, JALC in Japan. Um, in terms of the institutional repository side of things, it, we can have within the same repository, much like we heard with Explorer, the data site or Crossref DOIs, but we also have uh, handles as well. A lot of institutional repositories like the idea of if you have a repository for papers and data sets, they'll say we want handles for the papers and uh, DOIs from data site for the data sets. So it is a fast moving kind of uh, space in which you need to plug into many different systems here. And so when we're talking about uh, an organization's repository, what, the way we um, we're a hosted system, so we can host on uh, different um, cloud based services around the world. So we take care of data sovereignty, but as well, we can plug into any storage system that you want for your where your files live. And at the same time, while we're onboarding a client, we do things like, uh, do you need to migrate content ac across and do we need to do some crosswalking there? Do you, um, what kind of storage do you want to use? Do you want a custom domain? And one of the questions that we ask, we use a system called Basecamp to work through all of these, these workflows is, do you have a data site account? Yes or no? Uh, if yes, we'll use your keys to mint your DOIs. And if no, do you want a data site account or would you like Figshare to do all the work for you? So. We'll offer them the way to go and sign up to Datasite through Datasite as a, an individual member, but we can also uh, become the minter of those DOIs for you. And so when you're looking on the right hand side here, the workflow for most of these files in a repository is upload the files, metadata entry. At that point, you can reserve the DOI. There's also a review and curation workflow. Um, and then when it's when the item is made public, is when we mint the DOI on behalf of the um, researcher. So um, as you can see, we have hundreds of organizations who are doing this uh, through Figshare. Uh, we're minting the DOIs on behalf of that organization. The DOIs do belong to them. And I just wanted to, to point out that this is one of many different integrations that constantly have to be worked on. I think one of the advantages of having a um, actively developed repository, which I think all of these are, is that you can always be jumping on the next thing. So we've just overhauled our ORCID integration, for example, where ISO certified. We make sure that data sets, up in, uh, data sets end up in Google data set search, thesis, papers, posters end up in Google Scholar. All of these different workflows are things that need to be considered when making sure that your content is getting to a wider audience as possible. And so in terms of just some of the most recent updates we've done, we're sending data to, making, to make data count because we believe in having consistent metrics across the whole research system. And uh, we've updated the data site export to 4.0. Um, I just wanted to touch on metrics for a minute because I think this is in terms of a, a conversation and a workflow about understanding what's happening in the space. I think metrics are hugely important. 
We um, use uh, dimensions to get citation counts, which is the number of times the DOI is mentioned in the full text of an article, once per article, but it, it's not just in the reference list. And this has been very powerful for tracking uh, the DOIs, as you can see here, we all, we track it as one output, even though there's multiple versions, which you see with things like code. Um, and the same thing with altmetric scores that I think are, are very important. And the reason for this is because a lot of people are thinking now about how do we, particularly in a COVID world, how do we qualify what is good content? Uh, I think this is the next step for uh, data on the internet, academic data on the internet. Um, so you can search by citations and altmetric score and things like this within your repository. And I think this is powerful because it gives you the information. You can click through and see, well, just because it's got a high altmetric score, does it mean it's impactful? No, it's the same research as just tweeted his thing 8,000 times. At least it's transparent. There's no hidden messages there. Um, and I, I say this because we do the state of open data uh, report every year where we uh, query researchers on what is motivating them to make their data available, because I think this is uh, one of the things needed in order to move further faster with academia. And we see that, um, you know, funder requirements is up there, but full data citation is the, always the number one response that we get as to why people would want to make their data available. So I think as a community, we all need to be thinking about just making the minting of DOIs, a background uh, operation for the researchers, but at the same time, making sure that we're, we're discovering uh, the impact of that data and sharing it. So uh, in terms of what's coming next, because I think I've only got a minute left, we're updating the field of research codes. We've updated the field of research codes and we'll be sending that in the metadata today site, sending grant information uh, in the metadata uh, sending creators of affiliation. This was a request from an institutional client. I think it's it's really important now uh, that we have this agreed setup with Datasite in terms of we can mint DOIs on behalf of an organization to now think about how can we get those organizations involved in the conversation. It's, it's a two degrees of separation as opposed to one degree of separation. So we need to make sure that those clients are involved in the conversation going forward. That's a focus on our end of picture. Uh, overriding DOIs in the UI. So you can say, I already have a DOI. Um, in general, we're working on metadata schemas, which will be related to what we send to data sites. And one thing I'd like to see is, is as I talk about the, you know, how to make data reusable and the quality of outputs that we're thinking about is um, how do we label what has been curated, fair data badges, things like this, and having that filterable on a uh, data site, I think would be important because as we move from the left-hand side of things of having everything go through the publication to being able to just query different types of data without having to go through the uh, PDF um, in the middle, I think this is where data site plays a huge role and I'd like to see more conversation around that. How do we now look at the last 10 years of being getting data on the internet? How do we then make it reusable in a way that works for researchers? So we're happy to be involved in the conversation. And that's everything from me. You can find me there. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, and finally, uh, we'll wrap up with Pascal Becker from the Library Code, uh, who is also a contributor to DSpace. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I hope you can see my slides. Um, I promise to keep it quite short so we actually get some chance to get and talk with each other and, and maybe you have some questions for us. Um, so Library Code is a DSpace service provider. We are a certified DSpace partner, uh, registered data site service provider as well. We offer all kinds of services around DSpace and as by user details, the main idea is that we actually try to talk to each of our clients and find out what their actual needs are to get these space running, to use it the best way they can and to really look out for how we can help them doing that. Um, so individual, individual needs of our clients are really different. Some just needs a little bit of software development or some technical second level support while others ask us to run 
these plays completely for them. Um, things we, we really love to do, for example, are creating new features for DSpace, and I will show out in a minute the new DUI filter that is coming with DSpace 7.1 that we developed for two of our clients and now brought back to DSpace to the whole community. Um, we are engaged in the community, and that's something that is really, uh, really important for us. So I'm, I'm part of the data side. Um, services and technologies steering group. I'm in the DSpace steering and leadership group, and, and I'm also one of two speakers of the German DSpace consortium. And as mentioned, we provide code back and um, actually developed initially the, the, the data side support in DSpace when it came out with DSpace 4.0. So what I brought to you today is something where I'm really happy about that it's finally coming out. Um, we developed a logical filtering system for DSpace 7.1, where you actually can um, provide rules and use complete Boolean logic um, to configure DSpace for which items it should um, mint DOIs and for which not. So when, when we brought out the data set support in DSpace 4.0, um, the, the, the institution that, that did this with us actually needed um, DOIs for all of the items, and, and we're not interested in filtering and, and deciding which item does need a DOI and which not. And um, last year, we worked with um, Technische Universität Hamburg and Technische Informationsbibliothek Hannover on getting the possibility into DSpace 7 to, to decide which items do need a DOI and which not. And what we created is a, is a system where you can configure in XML rules that are defining, for example, if an item already has a DOI, please do not meet another one, or if it has a DOI that contains our prefix, if it has a metadata field containing our DOI prefix, then do not create another DOI, or, you know, please create DOIs only for items that do have files and are actually readable by anybody, so it's, it's available by, for the group anonymous. And what I love on this feature so much is that it's it's really powerful because you have whole Boolean logic to decide how to um, connect the conditions with each other and to, to do this all in a configuration that does not need any Java knowledge at all. You can extend it if you know Java and, and can implement new custom conditions, but you already can do a lot of stuff without, doing, uh, without knowing all of this, but just taking your hands on the XML configuration. This is a really short wrap up. It's coming with DSpace 7.1. There's a lot of information in the, in the documentation of DSpace 7 by then, but I just want to give you a heads up because that's a feature that we were so often asked for and um, that many, many people wanted to have in DSpace 7. And I'm really proud and happy that it's finally coming to DSpace. That was it already for me, looking for some questions. Great, thank you so much, Pascal. Exciting new features for DSpace that I think people will be uh, very pleased about. Um, so we do have a few minutes for questions. If you have some, um, please uh, type them into the Q&A section of your Zoom application. A lot of people shy about questions. I um, I have a I have a question personally in the since I also work on the the Roar project, and I know this was um, Roar was a topic that came up um, at the last session, which was about data site metadata. I'm curious about whether any of you um, are thinking about supporting Roar identifiers in your DOI integrations, or are doing it, or have already uh, incorporated Roar IDs. We have. Um, this is Tommy from uh, Presenting Explorer. So we, we uh, do do send the ROAR ID um, when we register. 
I didn't mention the, the details. Yeah. yeah, Dataverse, we haven't yet, but we're interested in it. Um, the external vocabulary support that I showed, um, that technical infrastructure will really enable us to, uh, to do that in a much easier way. Yeah, we also are doing it, um, implementing it. I mentioned it in my presentation in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're, we're doing it as part of, we did have grid IDs and then uh, we might, we now have RORs as well. And that's part of the work that we're pushing across as uh, creator affiliation uh, to, in the metadata piece of work we're doing now. Um, one question in the Q&A, this is for Tammy. How does Esploro compare to a system like Symplectic Elements? Uh, general question, um, but Wait. in principle, uh, Explorer aims to, to cover the functionality uh, and go beyond. I think we already go beyond in some cases, we have less functionality in other cases, but definitely we, um, we plan to enable to have the functionality so a customer could, you know, use Explorer instead of Symplectic. So again, we're trying to be many because we, we're trying to, to create a system that can be used for a variety of things based on essentially the data that is, is, is very similar. So, um, so uh, definitely I'd say it's comparable. Yeah. Um, a question for Susanna. Do you have any type of integration between IIIF content and DOIs? Well, we support uh, uh, IIIF APIs. So uh, I'm sure that we can examine this use case and, uh, and adapt it. Uh, um, if the question could be more elaborate, uh, I, I could elaborate more on the answer, but uh, maybe there's no time here. So I encourage the person to, to contact me and, uh, and we can go deeper into it. So maybe if there's no answer at the moment, I can I can go a little bit deeper now. Uh, AAAF content is managed uh, in um, both this space and this space via an add-on that we uh, developed, and uh, basically the uh, relation uh, is um, uh, is done by this space itself. So you can deposit an object in uh, in this space, get a DOI and then uh, the, the data side DOI, of course, and then uh, we use the AAAF uh, um, APIs uh, to allow visualization of the, of the object within the space, uh, to allow uh, to expose the manifest for, for other purposes and uh, uh, to control uh, the um, uh, authentication uh, to be able to expose the uh, resource uh, only for uh, authorized people if needed, uh, things like that. So basically uh, using this plugin, uh, the relation between the object and the DOI is controlled by the space itself. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, one more question for, for Tammy, are Esploro and Alma connected to one another? Again, that's, that's a pretty broad question. We're we're on Esploro and Alma are on the same platform, and we have some function some functionality that it, that is common. For example, we share the same users, so there's no need to because the assumption is that that uh, researchers are already campus users, so there's no need to set up authentication again for for Esploro. Um, we also have plans to more to 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 enable you to create an Esploro asset output from um, Alma, from the cat library catalog and vice versa. 
Um, so there are things that can be shared, um, analytics, you, you, the idea that we'll also be able to create shared analytics. So definitely we're looking to, um, since we're on the same platform, um, there's a lot that we can do there. Um, so uh, we have some and there's more coming. I hope that answers the question. And if you're interested in more details, we can of course take this offline. Great. Well, thanks so much to all of our presenters and thanks to everyone who joined for this session. Since we are running these sessions back to back, we'll, uh, I think we'll wrap up here. So we all have a few minutes to, to get to the next session, but yes, thanks so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks. Goodbye and take care everybody. Bye.